What to do when you misplay the opening and get a strategically lost position after the first 10 moves? When you are completely squeezed, have no chances for counterplay and your opponent starts a devastating pawn storm on the king side. In the game I'm gonna show you, all this happens to the future world champion Boris Spassky. However, Spassky doesn't give up and finds a miraculous idea. In the hopeless position, Spassky comes up with one of the most unusual sacrifices in chess history. A Dutch novelist and chess player, Tim Krabbe, even called it the greatest move ever made in chess history. Averbach starts with c4, but very soon the game transposes into the king's Indian defense. e4, d6, d4, bishop g7, bishop e2, short castle, and Averbach plays his own system, the Averbach variation. Before developing the knight, he develops his bishop, preventing black from playing e5. In this case, the knight would be pinned, and after the exchange of the pawns and the queens, white can play knight d5 with the double attack, attacking the pinned knight for the second time and also the c7 pawn, so white is winning in this variation. That's why black plays c5. Averbach crosses the center of the board, grabbing more space, and now the main lines for black is either h6 or e6, but in our game Spassky plays queen a5 instead, which is also playable. The knight is pinned, that means the e4 pawn is under attack, so Averbach retreats his bishop to d2. Now the pawn is defended, of course, and bishop d2 cannot be uh, considered a loss of tempo because the black queen is also now under the potential attack and sooner or later black will have to spend a tempo to uh, retreat his queen. Spassky plays a6, preparing the possible counterplay on the queen side with b5. Averbach prevents it once and for all a5, taking under the full control the b5 square. And here black should have played e6 in order to open the e-file. After a possible knight f3, e takes d, e takes d and bishop g4, black would have got some counterplay. Rook e8 is coming, the rook would be quite active on the open file, white would have only a slight advantage in this case. But in our game, instead of e6, Spassky made a strategic mistake. He played e5. But after this his position is almost strategically lost because now the uh, center is closed. On the queen side black doesn't have any counterplay because b5 is prevented and as the center is closed the white king feels absolutely safe in the center because black cannot open the center in order to create uh, some threats to the white king and Thanks to this, white can start the immediate pawn storm on the king side. And that's exactly what Averbach does. G4. He is going to move his uh, pawns on the king side, open the h file, and start a very strong attack on the black king. And there is nothing black can do against it. So, as g5 is coming anyways, Spassky retreats his knight in advance and also unblocks his f-pawn. So, in order to get at least some counter chances, he will play f5. Averbach, of course, plays h4 and f5, which is a standard move in the King's Indian defense. However, in this position, in this variation, it's very dangerous to play f5 because white is ready to open the files on the king side and by playing f5, black creates even more weaknesses on the king side. And, of course, Averbach plays h5. Now his threat is simple. First to open the h file after h takes g and then g takes f opening the g file after which the black king will turn into the target of a deadly attack. That's why in order to keep the king side as closed as possible Spassky plays f4. And now he is ready to play g5 closing the king side. In order to prevent it Averbach plays g5 himself. The queen returns to d8, attacking the g5 pawn, and Averbach makes another strong positional move, bishop g4, which leads to the exchange of his bad bishop, 
as you see, white pawns are on the light squares. For the blacks, good bishop, because black pawns are on the dark squares. Besides that, by playing bishop g4, Averbach indirectly defends his g5 pawn, because black cannot capture it, as he would lose the bishop in this case. So Spassky plays knight c7, and the bishops are exchanged. And only now, finally, Averbach develops his king's knight. Now his plan is simple. He is going to play king e2. The king will be absolutely safe on e2, opening uh, his queen's way to the king's side. So first he will play rook h4, then queen h1, double his major pieces on the h-file, followed by h takes g, after which the h-file would open, and the white pieces will invade black's uh, king side, of course. And it seems that there is nothing black can do uh, against this simple plan, because black doesn't have any counterplay. As you see, b5 doesn't work, the center is closed, black pieces are completely squeezed on the two ranks, the bishop is bad as it's restricted by its own pawns on the dark squares, the rook isn't doing much on the f-file, the queen is very passive and has no prospects, the knight has, doesn't have any prospects, prospects either because the e6 square is controlled by the white pawn, the second knight uh, also doesn't have any prospects. The only square it can move is d7, but where will it uh, go from d7? The f6 square is also controlled by the white pawns. So it seems that black is completely um, doomed and in a few moves his position will collapse. However, in this position Spassky finds the only way to create at least some counterplay. So he makes a move which was called by Tim Krabbe the greatest move ever made in chess history. You can pause the video and try to find it. How to create some counter chances in this hopeless position. So Spassky sacrifices a piece. He plays knight c6 right under the attack of the pawn. So, at first sight, it doesn't make any sense. Black simply gives up a piece for nothing. However, it isn't the case. The sacrifice had a very strong psychological impact on Averbach. He spent one hour um, before making his next move. So, he fell into a very deep thought. Actually, he wasn't thinking uh, about whether to capture the knight or not, because it's clear that white must capture the knight, otherwise it will jump to d4 and will be greatly placed on the central square. He writes in his annotations that he was thinking about the plan. He was trying to choose between two possible plans, either to continue the attack on the king's side after capturing the knight, or simply try to find ways to convert the extra piece. But he has to capture the knight, so he captures on c6. And now we can see the idea behind this sacrifice. After b takes c, we can see that the white pawn has disappeared from d5. That means the knight, which didn't have any prospects, now can jump to e6, and from e6 it will be rerouted to d4, and on d4 it will be greatly placed and it will dominate the center. And in case white exchanges this knight, the black pawn will uh, replace it, and black will get a protected passed pawn. Besides that, as the white pawn has disappeared from d5, now the center isn't closed anymore and the black pawn might move further, and that might lead to the opening of the center, after which the white king will not be that safe anymore. Besides that, after b takes c, the b file opens and the rook will be very active, so black will also get the counterplay on the queen side. However, objectively, of course, black's position is lost, but he now creates serious problems for white. So. Averbach opted for the first plan. He is going to continue the attack on the king side. Knight h4, attacking the g6 pawn for the second time. That's why queen e8, defending the pawn. Now Averbach opens the uh, h-file and plays queen g4. 
moving his queen closer to black's king side, to the black black's king, and rook b8, creating an immediate threat. B7, uh, b2 is under attack. Averbach makes a move which might look a little bit strange and passive. Knight d1, defending the uh, pawn with the knight. But he has his point. The knight has moved away from c3. That means now the rook's way to the king side is open. So he will double his rooks on the h file. Knight e6. Of course, the knight is heading to d4. Rook a3. Knight d4. And rook h3. And Spassky plays queen f7. Creating new threats. Attacking the c4 pawn. Averbach plays bishop c3. So, possibly he's going to exchange his bishop for the pride of black's position, for black's best piece, the knight. And in the anticipation of the exchange on d4, Spassky plays rook e8. Now, if white captures, the rook will already be on the half-open file, attacking the e4 pawn. That's why, instead of capturing the knight, Averbach makes a kind of prophylactic move, rook e8 h2 so that the rook might uh, defend the second rank after possible f3 also the rook has vacated the h3 square for the queen and white can create further threats on the h file and here spassky made a mistake Instead of d5, which uh, might have led to some activity and counterplay in the center, he captures on c4 but leaves his g6 pawn unguarded. And Averbach, of course, captures the pawn. However, Spassky had his point. By capturing the pawn, he creates some unpleasant threats. Checkmating threats, actually, on e2. The white queen cannot uh, leave this diagonal, otherwise uh, white would be checkmated. Besides that, black can play f3, closing the queen's access to e2. And the pawn on f3 would be defended by the knight. And it isn't clear how white is going to defend against the checkmate after this. However, uh, right away after knight g6, f3 doesn't work. Because in this case, white would sacrifice the exchange and it would be the black king uh, who will be checkmated in this case. After bishop takes, rook takes, king g7, queen d7 check and that would lead to a beautiful checkmate. The bishop retreats to d2 and the black king is checkmated. So uh, right away black cannot play f3. That's why Spassky plays rook e6, closing the white queen's way to d6, d7. And also attacking the knight. And here Averbach made a mistake. He captured on d4. But instead it turns out that he actually still could have won on the spot by playing rook h8 check. However, it seems that both players missed a very important point. After bishop takes and rook takes h8, king g7. Of course white wins the uh, rook. But f3. And what to do now? Checkmate is threatened, but white could have played knight f4, a brilliant resource, taking under control the e4, uh, e2 square. However, the knight, of course, can be captured by the pawn, but that's the point. The pawn, when the pawn captures, it's deflected from e5 and the bishop's diagonal opens. And it turns out that now the knight on d4 is pinned and it isn't actually defending the pawn on f3 and white can simply capture it preventing the checkmate and white is winning but it wasn't so easy to notice this idea that's why uh, Averbach instead of uh, playing rook h8 check simply eliminates black's best piece bishop takes d4 of course uh, Spassky didn't capture the bishop in this case after e takes d White would have played queen f5, cutting the black king on the f file, and that would lead to immediate checkmate. There is nothing uh, black can do against the threat of rook h8 check, for example, after rook e8, rook h8 check, rook takes. Uh, the king is checkmated immediately after the rook sacrifice and queen f7 checkmate. That's why, of course, Spassky didn't capture the uh, bishop. Instead, he captures the knight, 
And now White's pressure on the H file isn't so effective because the knight, which also controlled the H8 square, is eliminated. And the bishop is still under attack. So uh, also uh, Averbach cannot retreat the bishop at the moment. In case the bishop retreats, he would lose the E4 pawn with a check and the black center would uh, have become even stronger. That's why Averbach plays queen f5, attacking the black rook. And there is no way uh, black can defend the rook except retreating his queen. But this leads to the exchange of the queens. And only now Averbach retreats his bishop. So it seems that white is absolutely winning because white is up a piece. The queens are exchanged, that means black cannot create any checkmating threats anymore, and white must win. However, if we look deeper into the position, we will see that it isn't that simple. The white rooks aren't really doing uh, much on the h-file, because the h8 square is uh, controlled by the bishop. The bishop is passive, of course, uh, as it's restricted by its own pawn, but it plays a very important defensive role. So it makes the uh, rooks, the white rooks, absolutely ineffective on the h file. The knight is also passive. It cannot um, uh, be activated as the e3 square is controlled by the pawn. The bishop will also be kicked out of um, of c3 and the black pawns will become very dangerous the black uh, pawn center will uh, move forward and that might create very serious problems to white besides that black has a very strong rook on the b file and the second rook will be rerouted to the b file so Black has a clear plan to move his central pawns, to exert more pressure, to increase the pressure on the b-file, and while white doesn't have a clear plan, it isn't clear what should white do. So, although white is up a piece, it's black who has the initiative. So, Spassky starts the advance of his center, d5. Of course, now the pawn is under attack, and in case white captures, that would be a mistake, because now the black center would have become even stronger. So, after d5, Averbach defends his pawn, f3. And the black rook invades, rook b3, targeting the f3 pawn. Now he is threatening to play d4, kick out the bishop, after which the pawn will fall. That's why rook h3, defending the pawn. And c4 follows. So Averbach moves his king closer to his weakness, to the queen side. The king must take part in the defense of the queen side. Rook g6, attacking the pawn. So uh, white must defend it. Now that the rook has left the h-file, white's pressure on the h-file has decreased, and the bishop can leave g the g7. It's not uh, necessary to defend the h8 square anymore. First, Spassky plays d4, kicking out the uh, bishop. Bishop moves to uh, a5, and now bishop f8. In case the white bishop leaves the a5 square, bishop b4 check might be quite unpleasant. Averbach plays rook g4, rook d6, king c2, Rook d7, the rook is heading to b7, g6, rook b7, and Averbach was already in the time trouble. As you remember, he spent the whole hour uh, thinking about his uh, possible plan after the shocking knight c6 move. So he's in a time trouble. Besides that, it isn't clear what plan to choose, what to do. He is up a piece, but there is there isn't much he can do. So he, as he himself writes in his annotations, makes a pointless move in the time trouble, bishop e1. And Spassky continues the advance of his pawns. For, for black it's very easy to play, c5. Rook h4, now one more time white creates threats on the h-file, that's why the bishop returns to g7, and here Averbach makes a serious mistake. He had to... Uh, reroute his bishop to c1 so that the bishop takes part in the defense of the queen side. Instead, he makes a more active, uh, actively looking move, bishop a5. But now the bishop is far away from the king. It cannot take part, take part in the defense of the king. Besides that, on a5, the bishop will turn into a target of attack, as you will see. And Spassky makes another strong move, c3. 
after which the pawn, the white pawn, will disappear from b2, which will lead to the opening of the second rank. Besides that, after the pawn disappears from b2, it won't control the a3 square anymore, and the white rook will invade this square, creating threats. Rook a2 a check might be quite unpleasant, and also the rook might capture the pawn on a4. So, uh, Averbach captures on c3. Now, rook a3, targeting the pawn, threatening check. Uh, Averbach captures on d4. Of course, Spassky didn't capture with the c-pawn. After that, he would have only one passed pawn, and the bishop would, return, would remain passive, restricted by its pawn. So, he captures with the e-pawn, leaving the f4 uh, pawn unguarded, sacrificing it. But now he has two connected passed pawns, which will move forward. And the bishop has turned into the active attacking piece now. Uh, the e5 pawn has disappeared, and uh, sooner or later the d pawn will also move, and after that the, bar the dark squared bishop will turn into a very strong attacking piece. Averbach captures on f4. Now, before capturing the pawn on a2, Spassky first checks in order to lure the white king to d3, so that black can play c4, after rook takes uh, a4 of course, with a check, with a tempo. The white king cannot move to c1. In this case, white is losing on the spot after d3, opening the bishop's diagonal and threatening checkmate in 1. And after king, uh, after knight e3, to take under control the c2 square, still black is checkmating. A very beautiful checkmate would have followed. The rook sacrifice, after which rook a1 would be checkmate. So, after rook a2 check, the king is forced to move to d3. Now, Spassky first plays rook b1, attacking the knight, and after rook h1, only now rook takes a4. So, now that the rook controls the c4 square, c4 check would come with a tempo. Besides that, the bishop is under attack. So, that's why uh, Averbach plays king c2. In his turn, attacking the black rook and moving away the king from d3. Rook b5 followed. Now the bishop is under attack. And in case white moves the bishop, for example, uh, bishop c7, c4 would be very strong, taking under control all the squares the white king can move forward. And that means after rook a2 check, the king would be forced to move to the first rank and that would be very dangerous. So black's attack would be very strong. That's why Averbach didn't move his bishop and now it was his turn to confuse his opponent. And he played e5, leaving his bishop under attack but creating some possible counterplay. The pawn looks quite dangerous. However, it turns out that black actually could have captured the bishop. In this case, after e6, the pawn looks dangerous, but black could have stopped it. After c4, e7, the pawn needs only one move to promote, but d3 check, then rook a2 check, then rook e5 check, and the pawn is stopped. Besides that, uh, instead of this, after e5, Black could have simply captured the pawn. Probably Spassky was afraid of uh, rook e4, uh, which would activate the white rooks. So the bishop is under attack, and in case the bishop retreats, white would create very unpleasant threats. Rook h2, suddenly the white rooks are very active, and white creates some checkmating threats. However, instead of uh, retreating the bishop after rook e4, Black could have simply played c4, defending his bishop, and uh, after, in case white plays f4, for example, in order to force the bishop to retreat, uh, black is winning on the spot after rook a2 check, d3, and uh, if white captures the bishop, then simply checkmate in one. But it seems that Spassky was already tired, and after e5, instead of capturing the bishop or the pawn, he decided to capture the whole rook. Indeed, why to capture the bishop when you can capture the whole rook? So he played d3 check with the discovered attack on the white rook. Now it will be black 
who is up materially. So black was down a piece, but now he will capture the rook and will be up the exchange. However, after this sacrifice, Averbach seizes the initiative. Now his pieces will become much more active. As you will see in a couple of moves, the knight, which was passive the whole game, will turn into white's best piece. And after d3 check, the white king captures, black's strong pawn center disappears. It's destroyed. The pawn disappears from d3 and black doesn't have any attack on the white king anymore. And the white king will be centralized while the black king is passive. As you know, in the end game, the king plays a very important role and it must be centralized. So, rook takes f4. Now Spassky is materially up. Bishop c3. White saves his bishop. Rook takes f3. King e4. Rook g3. King f4. Rook takes g6. And the knight finally comes into play. Knight e3. Rook b8. Knight f5. Now the knight is white's best piece. Rook f8, pinning the knight. Rook h5, defending it. Rook e8. King e4. Rook g1. Rook h3. Bishop uh, f8. King d5. Rook d1 check. King e4. Rook c1. King d5. Rook d1. King e4. Rook d7. And Averbach makes a strong move. Knight h6 check. In case black doesn't capture the knight, doesn't exchange his bishop for the knight and plays king g7, for example, knight g4 might be quite unpleasant, threatening to invade f6, which will be very unpleasant at targeting both rooks. So, Spassky exchanges his bishop for the knight. Bishop takes, rook takes, rook h7. So now uh, black is up the exchange and the pawn, but one of his pawns, both of his pawns are weak, so one of these pawns will fall right away. Rook g6 check, king f7, rook f6 check, king e7, rook c6. So Averbach could have captured the a pawn, but he uh, decided to capture the c pawn instead. King d7, rook takes c5, rook h6, king d5. Rook b6, bishop a5, rook b5, which leads to the exchange of the rooks. It seems that uh, black is up the exchange, black must win, but Averbach voluntarily gives up his pawn. It wasn't necessary, but still, rook takes e6, and now king c5, attacking the pawn. The only way to save the pawn is rook e5 check and king b6. And it turns out that there is no way black can kick the king out of b6. In case black checks, white will simply capture the pawn. And white will simply play bishop b4, followed by bishop c5, closing the, the rook's way to b5, after which the king will simply capture on b5, and the game will be drawn. That's why in this position they agreed to a draw. And now I recommend watching Spassky's attacking masterpiece, in which he sacrificed the exchange and a piece to demolish the enemy king side. But first, like this video and subscribe, as it's really helpful for the channel growth.